Hello, Timmies. Thank you for joining us for this Purdue Timmy Global Health podcast. Our mission for this podcast is to educate our members on public health issues and promote meaningful engagement in our societies through fruitful conversation, lifelong learning, and advocacy. My name is Ella Domingo, Timmy's Global Health Roundtable Chair, and I'm a second year Doctor of Pharmacy student here at Purdue University. Today, we have the honor of hosting Dr. Servati Saib, or Dr. SS, the Purdue Honors College Associate Dean for Student Life and a professor of counseling psychology, as well as Megan Tucker, Timmy's Director of Development, as this episode's guests to discuss love languages, belongingness, and support. Dr. SS and Megan, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. I'm excited. Okay, just to start us off, Dr. SS and Megan, please tell us a bit about yourself and both your personal and professional involvements. So as you mentioned, I'm a professor here at Purdue. My area is counseling psychology. Uh, I do a lot of work in the area of grief and loss related to death, but also related to other life events. And much of my research in the the research of my team has been focused on college students and their well-being and their coping with stress. And so that's been a really important area for me. And the position in the Honors College has really let me bring some of that research um, and clinical experience to bear, really working on and advocating for uh, students holistically, their holistic being, their overall growth and development, uh, and really the emphasis on students being more than brains. I know that sounds silly, but college is not just about intellectual pursuits and academic achievement. It really is a whole experience um, of being. Um, And there's so much learning that happens both in the classroom and outside of the classroom. And so I think our topic today for me is very much related to that. Yes, um, and as you said, I am the Director of Development for Timmy this year, but outside of uh, Timmy, I'm a junior here in Industrial Engineering, um, and I'm particularly interested in the uses of Industrial Engineering in healthcare systems to utilize engineering principles to better serve those seeking health services. Um, I love utilizing Lean strategies to optimize production. Um, Optimization is something that gets me super excited, but I'm also just very interested in people and how to better serve them through health. And so I am also very excited about this conversation today because mental health um, and just the mental, like we said, sense of belonging and support is also so important in making people feel comfortable in who they are and where they are. Yes, I think that was really beautifully said, and this is going to be such an incredible pairing for our podcast today, and just interacting with both of you through Timmy and through the Honors College. I've definitely learned a lot from both of you, so thank you for that. So just to lay the basis for the conversation, I'm personally interested in learning more about it, and I'm sure our listeners are too, but what is belongingness and why does it matter? Mm -hmm. Well, I can start by saying belongingness to me is feeling that you are a part, that you are among those who accept you, who value you, who um, want to be engaged with you uh, and know, uh, you know, really what you bring to the environment, to the conversation, to the overall experience that people are having, that sense of just being able to relax into a space where you know, you have a sense of connection um, and and involvement and engagement with with others. Uh, It's related to a lot of factors for college students. I mean, it's it's very much related to uh, retention um, for students in terms of their ability to stay engaged and stay engaged on a campus. Uh, It's really related to almost every domain of how we function as human beings. Overall, we know that relationships, which are very much connected to belongingness, solid relationships is one of the best predictors of longevity for human beings in general. Uh, And it's also for college students related to academic achievement and also academic self-efficacy, that idea of believing that you can do 
the tasks that are in front of you, that sense of self-efficacy. And that sense of self-efficacy is very much related to the actual doing of, of, of those academic tasks. If you believe, then you're more, you're more able and you're much more likely to, to follow through and be successful. Thinking about Timmy and the overall perspective of health, actually health, physical health, belongingness for college students is related to their physical health. And there could be a lot of intervening variables there, but it's, it's connected. Uh, and we also know that it's very much related to psychological health. You know, the higher belongingness, the lower students sense of, of suicidal ideation, for example, in a very real um, and specific and um, intense kind of way. You know, we know that a sense of isolation, which is really oftentimes the flip side of belongingness, is very much connected to a sense of, you know, do I belong in the world? Should I be in the world in terms of, of, of suicidal ideation? And the idea of one of the things I would want to throw out, and we can, we can talk about this more in depth, but we, we need to be thinking when we think about belongingness about non-majority groups of individuals within our society and the risk for them not feeling that sense of belongingness, say because of the white-centered nature of, of much of the U.S. society or the um, you know, heteronormativity that is so much a part of our society. Those things are, are really critical issues to also keep in mind when we're talking about belongingness overall, but also specifically for college students. And Megan, I know as a student, um, you are living college community and belongingness every single day. So what is belongingness to you as a student? Yeah, I think um, hearing Dr. SS speak to that, a lot of that really hits home um, of experiences on both sides that I felt of uh, feeling belongingness as a student and also not feeling belongingness as a student. I know for me, particularly being in engineering, it's very easy to feel as if I'm not worthy of the degree that I am receiving in ways of I'm surrounded by incredibly talented and incredibly smart people every day. And that is such a blessing, but it also can lead to self-doubt. And so I think for me on my journey through Purdue, that's been something that I've been learning that everyone has their own unique place in the world and their own attributes that make them special and make them valued. And for me, learning that for other people has been really important, but most impactful has been learning that for myself and realizing that I can be an engineer and I could be passionate about healthcare and I could be a painter and I could be artistic and I could be a person that is more than my degree. And because of that, I felt a stronger sense of belonging because I've learned who I am and I'm starting to reconcile that with what engineering is asking me to be, what the world is asking me to be and really just figuring out where I truly fit in that puzzle. And I think you both stated it really well because we're not one dimensional beings. We are three dimensional communal beings. So the fact that you have these passions for art and you're also an excellent engineer, I think that lays the foundation of feeling like you can belong to multiple different communities and really thrive in your three dimensional self. So with that, given belongingness concerns a holistic self and involves self-awareness, how can we grow towards becoming more self-aware? I think Megan described it really well. I think it is a lifelong process, really. Um, I, I know that there's a, a significant intensity of learning who you are as a person within the college, um, traditional college years and graduate school as well. I know I learned a lot about myself in graduate school as well. Um, perhaps that's unavoidable when you study psychology and you're a human, but, <laughs> but it, 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 I learned a lot about me and some of it is being honest with yourself, right? To be able to make sure that you have time where you are intentional about that self-awareness where you allow yourself to be disconnected from, you know, electronics, but from other people, where you do take time to reflect on who you are uh, and have a genuine sort of sense of accepting both what your strengths are and where you are growing and continuing to grow as a person. Uh, I think that's really critical. Um, I think another piece of self-awareness for me is what we each contribute to 
other people's sense of belongingness? How can we also be more self-aware of the times where we include or exclude other people unintentionally, you know, by maybe our words or by our actions? So it's, it's a sense of self, but it's also a sense of self in a way that allows you then to be more inclusive and more encouraging of the belongingness of others as well. Those are the thoughts that come to me on that. Yeah, I want to pop in there because I think that's really great. And I think for me, a lot of the ways I've learned to become more self-aware, unfortunately, have been through trials and college has a lot of them. I'm sure we can all relate to at least some form of common trial, but I think speaking on being able to be more self-aware towards others, that's also been really impactful because the more I go through and the more I learn about myself, that's also the more I'm able to relate to other people. And not to say that we will ever be 100% able to step into someone else's shoes and understand, but the more common experiences we have um, and the more awareness we gain through that, I think has been really great towards being able to be self-aware as an individual, but also self-conscious of other people. Well, all I would add to that that occurs to me is because you were saying, Megan, about the the, the sort of the challenges, right, related to this, this sort of space. And I do think one of the most critical things we can do is have sort of what I call those process conversations about belongingness and allow others to know or encourage others to know that we're willing to engage in those conversations. The times when we have not uh, promoted sort of a sense of belongingness among others. I remember um, a graduate student I had very specifically who was new to the US um, from an Asian country and studying in the US. And the semester she began for research team, one of the ways we started research team was often talking about Netflix. She had never watched Netflix. She didn't know any of the shows that we discussed. And it sounds like, right, a small thing, but at one point she was like, you know, I feel a sense of exclusion every time team starts because I can't be engaged in the conversation. And it was really difficult for her to tell me that, but how critical it was for her to know that she could tell me that and I would take it seriously and that I would change my behavior and encourage a shift you know, in behavior and acts of inclusion within our research team. So how do we you know, engender that kind of, um, and I'm sure there's many times where I wasn't open to those conversations, but how do I make sure that others know that they can talk with me when there are situations where they feel less belongingness, where I may be able to, to, to take action for the good. And I think that really ties well with the next few points. And I feel like they're all intertwined. They all go together. So feel free to break this down however you'd like. But you mentioned meeting on teams and how we've done a good majority of this past year all virtually if not a hybrid of in-person and virtual but with that how can we sort of adapt our approach in showing this expression of care and curating belongingness in our own social circles because it, it's really difficult to do it virtually I just want to know your take on that because I, I have a lot of conversations with friends about that I think it's a struggle. Um, one of the things I've done intentionally is when I have meetings, I, especially regular meetings with people that are our groups that I help facilitate, you know, we make sure that we have time to do go around and share some things that are happening in our lives because we don't get to have those more spontaneous interactions with one another in the hallways uh, as we used to. Many of my colleagues are working virtually, you know, from their homes. And so um, you don't get that opportunity to have just informal conversation with one another about what's happening in your lives. And that does not, it's not the same, but it does still allow us to see each other as people and for our interactions to be more than, than transactional. Right. It's like you get into a meeting and it's like everything's business um, and it can't be like that's not how we function as people. I mean, it can be, but it's not very satisfying uh, or sustainable really in that way. I just read an article. I think it was in The Atlantic. I heard about it on NPR, too, where 
one of the things that we haven't been talking about that we've lost is the ability to interact with strangers almost, or people who aren't really friends, like the people you used to see at the gym or the people that, you know, when you came to work every day, you would pass on the sidewalk every day and smile and say hi to them. You know, we're not, that's, that's very different in terms of those more peripheral relationships, which may not seem as important, but, but, you know, add to our life, add to our sense of belongingness and our sense of connection to other human beings. So those are some, some ideas, some thoughts. Yeah, I think to kind of go back in the conversation a little bit, but I think what you say about meeting people first instead of having like business transactions is something that I think for me has really stuck out during this period of predominantly online interactions of, I think people can really tell the difference when you're hopping on a meeting and they're asking you how you are, you're having that time to go around and actually talk about yourself as a person, like this interactions that you would have in the hallways, in the office, in your classroom, versus when you hop on a meeting and it's go, 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 you know, here's the content, here is what you need to do and buy. And so I think for me during this time of virtual, it's been really important to have that people first mindset and to realize that this just year is really impacting people in a multitude of different ways. And I'm not one to say who that is or how that is impacting them. And to be able to meet people first and give them the time and space to have that and to have their struggles and to have their triumphs. Because if you're not being a person, it's very hard to also be in business or be a student um, or just even, you know, exist. <laughs> you have to be a person first. And that's been something that I know me and my friends have really been focusing on this semester as kind of a mantra of we are going to be students, and but we're going to be people first and we're going to take time for our own well-being because luckily I do have the ability to be in person with some of my friends here. And so we're really taking that as a blessing and not taking it for granted and, and using that to make sure that we're being okay throughout all of this. I love that you said, first and foremost, we'll take time to be people. I think I'm gonna write that down somewhere afterwards. Um, but another question I had was um, with some of my friends or just maybe acquaintances or people that I've interacted with, whether or not that's a longer period of time or shorter period of time, period of time, it can sometimes be difficult to open up to people who you might not know as well, or even the people that you know really well. Um, and I know in different conversations that we've had in the School of Pharmacy, whether or not that be counseling patients or just being with a patient at a difficult time or just doing that for my friends, what do you both think about um, reaching out to those who find it difficult to open up or maybe just don't want to open up at the moment and just need someone to be there? I think, I, I think part of your question there is connected then to this virtual world that a lot of us, the, you know, the, the, the broader sort of picture of how we interact with others now and how that makes it more challenging. It's interesting, actually. I think there's a dual sort of piece to that. I think in some ways, interacting virtually allows some to share more because there is maybe even a lower sense of intensity to the interaction. There's a distance that sometimes can allow people who are less likely to self-disclose to go ahead and do that. And yet on the other side, you know, there are those who it's more, more difficult to do that without having the physical nonverbals and just the physical presence. When Megan was talking, I was thinking about how, you know, people first, as, as you were saying earlier, three-dimensional people, like physical people. And even when you're not touching someone, when you are physically proximal to them, it's very different than interacting with them virtually. And again, I think some of it, that, some of it what's helpful to do in that situation is just to name it. Like I'm a very like concrete, direct communicator. Like if I'm feeling that from somebody, I'll say, you know, this is harder virtually than it might be in person. And yet we do have at least some channel, some opportunity, you know? And I think when, when individuals are hesitant, it's helpful to respect that hesitancy. 
oftentimes individuals who are hesitant in self-disclosing, you know, that's an adaptive behavior for them. And so thinking about who they are as people and how that behavior is not about you or them being resistant, it's really about them being self-protective perhaps and honoring that and respecting that and even naming the hesitancy as something that you respect and yet also communicating to them your openness to hear and to support them whenever and however they are comfortable and able to do so. Yeah, I think there's um, extreme truth to be said when you're talking about that. I'm thinking of experiences I've had in all of those definitions. Um, I think for me, being virtual has made me more comfortable um, as a personal experience. And I think that's because being virtual, like I can take a call from my house. I could take it from my bed. I could be in a space where already I have developed a sense of comfort and belongingness because it's my home. Uh, but I've also experienced people where that's not the case and it's been a lot harder for them to be communicative over this virtual period because it's really easy to click end meeting or to be on mute and to not speak your mind and to let people who may be louder or more vocal kind of cover that space for you. And so I think it's really important to realize that, you know, everyone's going through different things at home, but also speaking on some of those abilities to have confrontation over virtual is difficult uh, to bring up some of those things that, you know, when you're self-disclosing, they're not always easy. And it feels as if since we're home often in isolation or with very few people that our issues aren't as big or as noteworthy because we're not interacting with people in the personal sense anymore. It's something that I felt of like, do I really have these issues like is this something that's still bothering me if we're not in person or if it's not something that bothers me every day and so confrontation in that sense has been a really unique weird tumultuous um kind of just experience <laughs> with it i should say but being able to be on the other side of that and just create an open space for people who do need to bring up issues or need to bring up something that's personal to them is also difficult because I think it's hard to tell sincerity over virtual as well. And this doesn't sound super fun because everything sounds difficult. But <laughs> I think it's something just I've become more aware of as we've done this longer and something that I hope to learn from this conversation, uh, from research and from more personal experience of if this is gonna be something that we default to in the future, how do we make you know, the virtual world better? How do we allow people to exist more prominently into who they actually are through a computer, through a phone, and how do we still have those in-person type interactions um, and make people feel the value that they hold if we can't do so in person? The only thing that comes to mind to me is the idea of being, which we've touched on, but being conscious of the language we use and, um, the manner in which we discuss certain issues uh, around inclusion and exclusion. Again, you know, I go back to that. When I think about belongingness, it's really about, do you feel included? Do you feel excluded? Uh, and in the physical spaces, you know, even on our own campus, you know, what are the words we use to describe things? What are the what are the um, pictures that are on the walls in buildings? I mean, when we think about physical space, is it inclusive or exclusive, right? But then Megan, you brought up in terms of the virtual space, is does that allow for more inclusion without some of those physical tri triggers that might indicate exclusion? Or how does that process function virtually uh, in the language that we use. You know, it's often about assumptions we make about those who are in the room, whether that's a physical room or a Zoom room, you know, what are the assumptions that we make? And sometimes those assumptions are what then lead us uh, to engage in conversation or use language that is more exclusive than inclusive and, and, and creating belongingness for those that, that we're engaged with. Um, so we touched on that, but a couple of added ideas related to that. And thank you so much to both of you for your perspectives on that. And I feel like 
throughout this conversation, we've really hit a lot of the topics that we might view as, oh, this is so inconvenient to talk about right now. Let's just push that aside until later. But I feel like, you know, as human beings, our time is finite, but I really think these are valuable conversations that will yield great outcomes if we just take the time to have them with a lot more people. So I've just been really enjoying my time with both of you. And as we move on to this last sort of topic, um, I wanted to ask about love languages. And I feel like they're a great application of the different things that we learned, maybe in a more lighthearted sense. Um, so did you both take the fun love languages quiz that we sent you? Yes. Yes, I did as well. Mm -hmm. And I had my partner do it as well. Just, you know, Aww. why not? <laughs> so if you, either of you want to share what you got and how that applies to your day-to-day -day lives, I'd, I'd love to hear. I love learning about people's love languages. And so maybe, I mean, it might be helpful to say, right, that, that to me, this, the love language sort of concept really allows for shared uh, terminology, shared definition as we think about how we express our affection for others, our connection with others, and how we feel more connected or included or a sense of belongingness from, from others. And so I know Megan will speak to this as well, but it's broader than just thinking about romantic partnerships uh, in that way. So, I mean, I'm, I, I, I came out pretty even with my top two in terms of acts of service and quality time. Uh, and my partner was very much the same. And what was interesting to me was, have we grown in that way together? Cause we've been married for almost 20 years or did we start out that way? And I think it's a little bit of both, but that's an interesting part of it to me too, is how th there might be shifts and changes within particular relationships and how you might need different sort of things from from different individuals at different times. Um, but Megan, I think it would be good for you also to explain the different love languages if you're up for it, because I think you are more familiar with this than me. It's a relatively new sort of idea to me. Yeah, of course. So when I actually took the love languages test as well, I test highly with quality time being my number one and acts of service being my number two. So I think that's an awesome little connection there. But just a quick overview before we keep diving into this, the lovely languages, there is five um, of the main ones. There are words of affirmation, acts of service, receiving gifts, quality time, and physical touch. So in my kind of Megan version of definitions, uh, words of affirmation is just for people who, when you have a compliment, when you're told that you're doing a good job, that's something that touches you and something that you hold on to. Um, and hearing validations is kind of how I view um, words of affirmation. For acts of service, um, I see this as someone asking me if they, like, if I need a coffee when they're out and picking it up for me and bringing it back or folding my laundry if it's laying on the floor and I haven't had time to get to it. Realizing where people have the stressors in their life and trying your best to relieve them without them asking you is how access service functions. Receiving gifts, I think this one is pretty self-explanatory. Gifts are fun. It's nice to have flowers um, or a favorite food shown up at, you know, when you come home to your house or come home from work. But I think it's also tied into sentimentality and for, you to realize other people have sentiment over certain items or certain places or certain memories and feeding into that um, and loving them in that way. Quality time, one of my favorites, is just spending time with people um, and realizing that like people are people and trying to get to know them as who they are and get to know them deeper in that sense. And really just having those kind of like walls down conversations is how I view quality time. And lastly, physical touch. Um, this pops up in lots of different ways, whether it's you know a high five or it's a hug if you're feeling sad or just like a shoulder to cry on. Um, this one, I think people tend to see in more of a romantic sense, but can also be very much a friendship definition where you have friends that you know just need a hug on a good day or a bad day or 
you just feel reassured by physical touch, whereas, you know, other people, maybe that's not the case as well. So for me, a lot of this love language application has been in friendship. I got introduced to it when I joined a sorority here on campus, and it's been something that has been really impactful for my college experience as well, because I often fall into my way is the best way, and that is not the case. And so learning how I feel loved um, and also how I give love, those I think are different, um, as well as how other people, you know, give love and receive love has been really important for my relationships here and being able to meet people where they need it when we're struggling. Um, a lot of my friends here in my sorority are physical touch people, which for me, physical touch is literally last on my list. But <laughs> I realized being around people that, you know, if they're sad, they need a hug. And that's something where I can meet them there because I understand how they receive love. And also for me being quality time, they realize that the most loving thing they could do for me is sit down and just talk and talk through whatever's going on. So it's been huge to better understand those who I'm around as, you know, as who they are and how they love and how they receive love and to build those deeper relationships because you have a better understanding of who you're around and who you're truly being friends with. And I think I can definitely see how your top two um, play out in your lives. Like Dr. SS, she acts of service. She sends out emails, um, if not every day, you know, every few days about how we as honors students can focus on our mental well-being. And I, I view that as a great gift in my inbox um, every few days. And, and I read through them. And I think um, as through your professional career, Dr. SS, um, I mean, naturally, I see you every time I've seen you in a presentation, you have such a gentle, compassionate way about you and that shows you as someone who wants to get to know these students and spend time with them and also be able to have those fun, lighthearted conversations or those most more difficult conversations. So I really love how I can see acts of service and quality time through your work both uh, personally and professionally. And then Megan, fun fact is that I think that might've been one of the very first conversations I had with you because we had a Timmy retreat and we carpooled in the same car uh, back to Purdue's campus together. And we, the people in the car were just like, wait, you know about love languages? What's yours, what's yours? And afterwards, I think Megan and I were just like, hey, you wanna grab coffee? I'd love to talk to you and get to know you more. And look at this, we're, we're on a committee together. And I think just talking to people and asking them, hey, I mean, not, not in a direct way, but um, how can I get to know you better? So that if we interact, I know how to meet your needs, whether or not we be deeper friends or acquaintances, I feel like it's so valuable to have those conversations. And for me personally, I have quality time and words of, affir- words of affirmation as my top two. And a good mix of those is my favorite thing ever is just to either have a meal with my family. Um, So I spend time with them and I talk with them about, hey, how is everything going? Um, Or I grab a cup of coffee with a friend and just talk to them and ask them, hey, how is life going? Like I I will literally ask, how's life going? And then you can take that a million different ways and just sit there and be with that person, meet them where they're at. And I value love languages because of this. Um, So with that awesome conversation that we had, I, this is a great start to my morning. Um, What are the final things you want to share with our listeners regarding everything we've talked about, belongingness, support, love languages? Yeah, I just want to pop on and say, this is very true. Our very first conversation was about love languages, which just feels very full circle. And that is awesome. Um, And just to kind of wrap up that conversation, I think that's very intuitive of how awesome like me and Ella's friendship has been able to be is because right off the bat, we were able to kind of take off all those barriers and like who we really are as people and be like, hey, like, how do you receive love? Who are you? And what and does that mean for you? What does that mean for your interactions? Um, and it's just 
given way to a really awesome partnership and friendship throughout, I guess that was almost a year ago, maybe even more now, but I think that's just a really great kind of testament to what we're talking about here of when you break down people and when you like see them at their core, that's long lasting. And that's something that we shouldn't take for granted. And it's just a really awesome thing to experience. Yeah, I love that. I love your reflection there, Ellen, connecting to both of us and our experiences and the ways that you've interacted with us. I, I think that for me, as we talk about the overall uh, issue and, and, and focus on belongingness, some of what I will take from this conversation is how actually encouraging belongingness is connected to talking about belongingness. Like so often we move through the world and it's easy to be in relationship with others in a way, but not always to, what, what my daughter says, go to the meta level and talk about those relationships. It seems odd to discuss how we're relating to one another. And yet that is critical. Like we relate and we have solid connections and communication with other people, but do we also talk about what it's like to be engaged with one another? And do we open up those doors for conversation where we feel more or less connected or we're, we're mismatched in how we're trying to support one another or not? Like, can we have conversations about when things are going really well and when we need to be talking about different points of, of disconnection? And, and, and can we have that kind of conversation with one another? What I love about the love languages, as you experienced, it allows for that conversation in a very concrete sort of way, you know, and then can that lead us to other ways of being able to talk about when we are uh, relating well to each other and, and when we're not, um, and to make that possible, to make those conversations possible, you know, that level of, of um, consideration talkable, because we don't really do that. I do that as a psychologist, so it's totally my bias, <laughs> but I believe that being able to talk about talking and being able to talk about relating, that's really part of what allows for the deepening of relationships. Uh, so I, I think that's one thing I'll really take with me and is connected to much of what we've discussed today. Yeah, I could not agree more fully. I think some of the kind of, I'm a big logical sum things up type of person. And so what I really take from that is intentionality and getting to know people as people. Absolutely. And then just on like a really much broader sense of emotional intelligence, I think it is a lifelong journey and something we're like becoming more self-aware and all of those things that we've touched on is really just learning who you are emotionally, who you are as a person, and then also relating that to the people you're interacting with and that having those deeper conversations that really has to come from a place where you understand yourself and are willing to be vulnerable and walk into that conversation with other people and relate to who they are emotionally and who they truly are at their core. And so those are just kind of my two big topic takeaways from this. And it's really just been awesome to have this conversation. And even now I'm like reflecting on different ways that I could apply this, I'll listen back and probably come up with four different more ways of how can I reflect and become more self-aware and really just take my actions seriously and think about how, you know, I relate with people and how people relate with me. And, you know, like I said, that's a lifelong journey of just really learning how to be a person and then how to encourage other people to be their own person. And with that, I don't really have much to add because I think both of you just put everything so perfectly. So with that, thank you so much to both of you, Dr. SS and Megan, for this enriching conversation. So to our listeners, we encourage you to check out the additional resources on this topic in the various links provided. If you're on Spotify, give us a follow. If you're on YouTube, hit subscribe. And that's all for this episode. Stay safe and stay well, Timmies. And we will see you next time on our next Timmy Global Health podcast.